This episode of EduQuest is sponsored by Acceptly. Want to get into the college of your dreams? Check out acceptly.com. Acceptly takes the guesswork out of the application process by guiding you step by step through it. You will know exactly what step to take when and receive the resources you need at each step. Get extra guidance from professional college counselors. And best of all, it's entirely free. So go and check out Acceptly today at acceptly.com and follow them on Twitter at Acceptly. Please thank Acceptly on Twitter for their support of EduQuest. <laughs> So welcome everyone, um, I'm Kirsten Winkler, this is EduQuest, as every week we're on the search for better education. Today I'm very happy to be joined by Marco Massoni, he is the co-founder and CEO of a startup called Einstein. Welcome Marco to the program. Thank you Kirsten, it's my pleasure to be on here. So tell us a little bit about yourself first, um, maybe particularly then in connection mm. to what led you build um, the company Einstein is? I, I'm a career changer, so I started out in entertainment finance on the legal side and I went back to education. I say went back because during law school I taught. I always taught on the side and I had a passion for education. My wife is an educator and then I started having children and so it made me think really about their future prospects in the educational system and, and whether or not it was going to serve them. I started to teach myself uh, high school, middle school history, and what I found was um, there were certain deficits. I, I was teaching in classrooms that had all the gadgets you could imagine, but the deficits uh, existed in that students were not probing, they weren't drilling down very deeply when they were doing research, when I was giving them assignments. And I found it curious. And so I would have them show me what they were doing on a smart board. And I saw that, in fact, no surprise, it was a couple clicks on Google. And then that's basically it. And it got me thinking, what, am I, what should I be doing uh, to better address these students' deficits? Because I knew that the students outside the classroom were doing incredible things using social media, using their computers, their phones, sometimes in the classroom, that had nothing to do with the traditional education they were getting. So for me, the challenge became, how do I help students get to the good stuff, the good content? What are the tools needed for this? And that eventually led me to creating, uh, starting Einstein. So this typical uh, finding, what we um, hear rather often, that uh, students make a Google search and either the very first search result or the very first ones, then let's say if they make sort of a, a list, are taken as uh, the best and the, the results that um, presumably for them deliver everything they need or they, they, they believe everything they need about a particular topic or mm -hmm. subject. Mm -hmm. right, exactly. And I, I mean, let's face it, there's a flood of data on the Internet and Google does a great job of helping us sort through the clutter. But ultimately, the best way of, of sorting through it is, is by harnessing the power of other people mm -hmm. who are curating content. So that's really we were founded on this notion that we need to build a tool to help people help, help each other curate good content okay. or the content that's helpful to them based on their interests, whatever it is they want to learn. Uh, and that started us thinking, well, really, it's not just about what you learn in the classroom. It's about what you want to learn. Uh, and that, for me, yeah. is where it gets interesting. I think uh, by far the majority of our learning takes place outside of the let's say traditional yeah. classroom and um, well when I when I read about Einstein um, 
and of course it's always hard to put it in one catchy phrase but you sometimes read it's a microblogging uh, site or a community for education related content but maybe you want to um, tell us a little bit more in detail what you are focusing on with uh, with creating it sure. and with the platform itself. Sure. Uh, what, what Einstein tries to do is very simple. Well, it's the, the mission is, is, is pretty clear. We, our mission is to turn learning into a social experience with real-world relevance. So we want to make sure that people are having the ability to learn outside the inside the classroom the way they learn outside the classroom. Everything you do when you're outside the classroom involves a, some degree of learning, mm -hmm. whether it's shopping, looking for entertainment, or even uh, playing games or finding uh, people that share the same interests as you and uh, the same hobbies. So that's we, we, we want to harness what's going on there and bring it into the Einstein community of learners and provide a context. So essentially what you have is a network of learners which is solely preoccupied with exchanging knowledge, with learning uh, about a specific interest of theirs or finding a new interest. There's a certain element of serendipity here. And then the real world relevance part is, this goes back to another thing that I noticed is and I think every teacher um, has, has keyed into this, and it's common sense. You are more open to learning something, and you learn it better when you're interested in it. So how do you make sure that you're teaching students things that they're interested in? Well, most of the things that they're interested in are going to be things that relate to what's going on in their lives or what they read about, that uh, events that are occurring today or occurring recently or are on the public agenda or the in the zeitgeist. And so how do you do that? Well, you let students and teachers and other learners, because we're all lifelong learners, mm -hmm. whether they're scholars or, or hobbyists, come up with the ideas to what is something that's worth talking about, exchanging ideas about and discussing. Um, so that's the why of what we do. And how we do it is, Everything that uh, all the discussions that take place on Einstein, because Einstein, think of Einstein as a microblogging platform. Mm -hmm. Okay, all the discussions are organized around projects, and each project reflects an interest. The interest might be a course. We have uh, 2,200 courses, course projects in the system, or it might be fantasy football statistics, or it could be um, ed disrupting education. It, it could be literally anything. But the context is always going to be the exchange of knowledge and learning. Mm -hmm. um, so we're more content-centric, if you will, or knowledge-centric than we are person-centric as, as, uh -huh. as a social network. I understand. And, um, well, I am probably, or I have been following you for roughly two years now, I would say. And um, back then, I felt much more like, you put a video in the center of the attention. Uh, also from the site itself, it looked much more similar to something like Academic Earth, maybe yeah. even uh, Udemy. And um, one could say that uh, we are seeing more and more examples of video-based education, so there seems to be uh, something there. Of course, those startups have to prove themselves, and uh, it's still early on. But um, why did you then this, um, this very distinct change and mm -hmm. say we focus less on that, even though it might be promising, and go mm -hmm. much more on this uh, thread and uh, exchange of and, and building a content base? What, what, what did you or do you see in that that you say, okay, we take a much more, if you want, yeah. uh, risky uh, approach um, that n nobody, at least to my knowledge, um, has taken before? Right. Um, I don't mean to downplay the importance of video. I, I think mm -hmm. uh, lectures delivered through video, Khan Academy style or, or as they're aggregated on academic earth or the kind of 
do-it-yourself approach on Udemy is great. It is a form of learning that um, is not naturally interactive. Mm -hmm. um, and what we were interested in is the real-time component and actually blending the real-time component with the asynchronous aspect. Let me explain. Um, our current partner at Stanford University and uh, University of Sweden, Gothenburg, this program called Inquiry to Insight, has this great environmental science curriculum. They have students around the world, literally China to Croatia, everywhere in the world, do a carbon footprint calculation. Mm -hmm. And then they have those students discuss their results on Einstein and have an active exchange. Now, for us, that's really interesting because it's asynchronous in the sense that you can jump onto the discussion at any time. You can even pick up discussion threads that occurred uh, when students did it previously, a few months ago. But also, it's real time in the sense that you're talking about how this applies to your life now and to the environmental issues and problems of today. And, and you're bringing that into the discussion. So it's dynamic. It's interactive. Mm -hmm. Now, where does video fit into this? Well, video is just another form of content. Sure. Um, so we are not interested so much in being the content provider. Mm -hmm. uh, where we started out was we were helping, it was always about helping people find the best content. Um, we just started, happened to start with uh, online university courses. They weren't just videos, they were actually courses. And so we gathered together teams of curators who helped us sift through all the open courseware and open educational resources out there, and we became known as providing a great easy way to find top university courses that were free. But it was always our intent to build the communication platform so people could interact around these courses and talk about them. And these courses then could come to life. You could have an engineer in Zimbabwe uh, talk with an engineer in uh, Los Angeles, and they might compare notes. Um, now, the communication platform that we started to build, it became evident to us that that was really the engine and that the courses were really just part of the content and that ultimately we had to have complete faith in the power of the crowd to uh, harness knowledge and information and good content. And so we shifted in our thinking and thought, well, really, it's about the crowd generating the mm -hmm. content through the mechanism that we give them. Mm -hmm. Now, what you, what you mentioned is it's risky, it's different. Yes and no. It's already going on everywhere throughout the Internet, crowdsourcing knowledge, exchanging ideas. You have people with great exchanges at the end of articles or in blogs or at the end of a TED lecture. What we're doing is we're creating a platform for all these conversations to take place. Are we going to be the only platform? No, no. But we're going to be a platform where you can have a conversation that um, is not isolated in a silo uh, and and can be picked up. Mm -hmm. So, as I understand, and uh, I would definitely agree, this um, idea of uh, peer learning, so learning from uh, the interactions and exchange with uh, your study partners or, or peers and that there is great value uh, within the content, um, definitely. On the other hand, as you said, there's so much content outside, also so many sites and platforms that um, the, the silos, I have a profile there, I have something there. So in the end, I ask myself, where's the benefit for the students? Certainly, I learned something, but I think you have a maybe a deeper idea standing behind that and looking probably uh, sometime in the future here, but um, when I read about your learning profiles and the options I, I have in creating one, um, sort of uh, what do you imagine is the proof or is the benefit uh, for the students in, in having one? Well, let me take a step back and you know what our learning profile is and uh, let me just explain quickly. Instead of having uh, just a profile that would allow you to say this is who I am and this is my favorite link or this is a link to my blog, what we're actually doing is providing people with a, a chance to see 
what their uh, what um, another member's activity is on Einstein, the projects that they've created or they've joined, or the posts that they've uh, that they've contributed or learned. Um, you see, whenever you look at a post, you have the option of clicking learn. There's a learn button. By doing so, you're, you're doing a few things. First of all, you're putting it into a, a, a full, uh, a, an area that's private, and you can then organize it as you wish. So that, for a student, allows you to um, basically have an area which is yours for research and for organizing your materials or, or posts you find that might help you uh, on a project. Um, those folders will be shareable, so you'll be able to collect research on, say, Macbeth if you're doing uh, an essay on Shakespeare and conflicts in Shakespeare. But then all that activity gets reflected in a learning profile. So one of the, going back to me in the classroom, uh, the problem with students who were only clicking Google a couple times um, uh, results and, and not going much farther than that, is that I wasn't able to diagnose or to follow their data trail to see, okay, this is what they're doing or this is what they're not doing, and then actually step into that and go, this is what you could be doing. This is how you might, another approach you might take. And then for those students who maybe have found something rather exceptional or doing something interesting, I could point them out as being uh, models, if you will, for, for other students that, that could be struggling. So the, the, learn, the learning profile is essentially uh, a way of tracking what someone is doing on Einstein, eventually off of Einstein, that's related to their learning. Now, what I find interesting about this also is that it has a bunch of ramifications. One, uh, we're looking at how we bring in a badging system. So we start to recognize you uh, mm -hmm. for the content that you've added and the content, content that you've absorbed. But also, it, it, the other ramification is that it starts to bring us closer to a meaningful type of resume. You could even call it a real-time resume. Yeah. What's always bothered me, because I've hired people, and uh, of course I've been on the applicant side as well, you've got your cover letter, your CV, and then maybe you point out a couple of uh, interesting links if they exist, if they exist, about you. Uh, mostly people are going online, people meaning recruiters or the people reviewing you as a candidate, to make sure you're not embarrassing hmm. you're, or, or you are what you say you are, or maybe to see something that, that really stands out. But um, unless you're a blogger such as yourself, I'm going to have a hard time finding material about you that really tells me, oh, she really knows her stuff. She's, she's, she's not only an expert on paper, she's an expert in reality. So the learning profile is really a way for people to show that this is what they're actually learning, engaged in, and interested in. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, definitely our social graph is much discussed, and uh, maybe this is a step towards the, what I call uh, a knowledge graph uh, or building a knowledge graph. Do you then think it yeah. is enough that you um, keep it on, on Einstein? So as, yeah. don't we need to establish, like, uh, in the education space relevant and um, binding sort of um, qualifications and measurement units that you can say, um, I integrate this in Einstein, but it shows beyond our platform, it shows to the person something, and this person knows when I see this learning profile on Einstein, I know that it's, it's relevant and it's really something there, and they don't have to investigate, okay, what does it mean, a learner of this and that profile on that platform, um, yeah, is really a potentially interesting candidate for me. So don't you think we have to put something together in the education market? But I yes. know it's, it's difficult <laughs> as everybody wants to keep their, so somehow their data for themselves, what I can partly, let's say, at least uh, understand from a business perspective. But, yeah. We take the view that um, we do need to reach out and work on this together. Um, we are very much interested in collaboration and openness. That doesn't mean that, um, uh, I, I mean, I think when people say 
we want to disrupt education, you have to be careful. There's, there's, you want to change the way edu uh, education takes place so that um, it's more relevant, it's richer, it's it's more dynamic, mm -hmm. more useful. But then there's um, the part that threatens kind of the brick and mortar and the established ways of, of delivering education. And um, that would be the universities that have a model, um, or, or even schools, but mainly universities and higher education where that have a model which is dependent upon their proprietary knowledge um, mm -hmm. as delivered in various ways, having a price attached to it that gets paid through tuition dollars for the most part. I think we're starting to see that break down. Now, it's going to take a long time to break down, but frankly, we're not on a mission to go head-to-head -head or toe-to-toe -to -toe with these academic institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our belief is that whatever we're doing to disrupt education can help anyone. Um, not just these academic institutions. So I think it's beneficial for anyone to engage in the dialogue about how do we make this measurable and how do we have standards so that we're not all creating a system that might work for us but might not work for anyone else and how are we avoiding the trap of creating a, a silo, a vault, where the activity takes place and it's out of public view. Mm -hmm. um, and that's... Mozilla is a leader in this, and uh, we're interested in working with other people who are trying to put together a system of badging mm -hmm. uh, that would be a step in that direction, uh, a, a way that has a common platform so that the look of the badges might be different, mm -hmm. but um, there is uh, fungibility in terms of uh, how these badges are, um, what, what underlies the badge themselves, the badge itself, a, a specific badge. So it's not tell us a little problem. bit about um, how how do you think um, a corporation or this um, competition with uh, with Mozilla? Um, how do you work together with them? Well, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, we're we're partnered up with again with uh, this environmental science program. Mm -hmm. Some of these students who are actively on Einstein talking about their carbon footprint, and then talking about alternatives to alternative fuels, all alternative ways of, of dealing with the problem, um, some of them are going to, are, are shining, are, are really outstanding contributors. And uh, it would be lovely to see, uh, well, we will have badges soon on Einstein, but I've been holding back on that because I want to do it in concert with other badge makers. But it would be lovely to see some of these students who really merit uh, recognition for their contributions to have uh, be afforded special or, or to earn special opportunities, mm -hmm. be they for internships or for closer interaction with, with scholars or um, eventually even um, opportunities for scholarship and for advanced studies. I think that's where we start to... Um, close the gap between interest and opportunity. The interest I have in environmental science and how I manifest it and how it's recognized through badges, for instance, mm -hmm. and the opportunities that open up because of my hard work. This may or may not have anything to do with whether I'm a straight A or whatever grading system you use, student in my classroom. Um, it, it, it Obviously, that that's not something that we exclude. It, it's part of the whole picture of the student. But certainly it would be an important way of uh, tying what you do and what, you, what your career prospects are. Mm -hmm. very I think that's a real problem. Yeah, very interesting. And do you think, uh, if I'm not completely mistaken, you have a not non-for-profit um, so sort of model? And um, before you discuss it a little bit, that of course traditional uh, universities uh, worldwide, particularly in the U.S., have of course an interest that you take their master's or whatever degree program and sometimes uh, often pay uh, a considerable amount of yeah. money for it. But do you think that essentially and maybe uh, eventually free will be the model for um, education, that you have more sort of 
patronage from um, either people you helped with their education mm -hmm. and who want to say thank you and maybe yeah. be donators later on, <laughs> um, on a, a smaller or larger scale. I mean, if somebody right. becomes a millionaire or even a billionaire, what we have with the big universities that you simply give back right. to your alma mater or that big um, companies like uh, Mozilla or Google, what they do with uh, Google, for instance, or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation with Khan Academy, that mm. they give grants uh, and support those, um, let's say, big ideas uh, for education then um, this way, rather than having a business model where the users pay per month or term or whatever. Well, let me, let me first say that we have pivoted from the mm -hmm. not-for-profit model to okay. the for-profit. So let me just be upfront about that. Everything ah, you but do, that's interesting. Why right. why you why right. did you decide that um, it's maybe that the other one is maybe more um, relevant or interesting yeah. for you? Mm -hmm. I I think it's part of trying to serve as a bridge between how people are being taught and how they want to learn. Uh, for me, the opportunity, I've worked at nonprofits, and there, there's great things about it, but there's also, it's, it's very difficult to, to be one, one of the few, the, the Wikipedias or the Khan Academies that uh, are able to gather, who do great things and get media attention and therefore get the foundation dollars. Uh, and, and certainly I've worked uh, at nonprofits where you get uh, funding from the public sector, and that is dicey at best, and particularly in this global economic climate. So when we were uh, looking at how we were going to pivot toward the communication platform, mm -hmm. we also looked at, well, it, it makes sense for us to look at, look at it this way. For the end u user, for the individual, it's, it's going to be free. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, unless you're uh, in a very small category of individuals. For, but for institutions, at, at a certain point, um, they're going to have to pay money for the service. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a number of reasons why they would want to do it. One of the things that I think gets overlooked, and I've, I've written a little bit about this, is that we focus a lot of attention on academic institutions. We forget that there are amazing resources being generated by public institutions, by NGOs, by cultural institutions, by nonprofits, and that material is often just sitting there, and it's not being used. And these are institutions which, by the way, have wonderful curators. So our, our attention is, a, is actually moving in that direction as well. What we see is an opportunity to work with those kinds of institutions to help them engage their members and their constituents, and in so doing, fulfill our mission, um, which is to help students have a platform where they can share knowledge uh, with other learners, and uh, have a fun time doing it, collaborate in the process, and maybe, just maybe, discover things they hadn't given any thought to. Um, the whole serendipity mm -hmm. of discovery for us is very exciting. I've seen students who came into Einstein for an assignment then start to create projects that were related to fashion or to music. And I love that. That's, that's exactly what we're set up for. What I'd like to do is start bringing in some of those cultural institutions so they can also, we can have some other points of view and some other materials that are, that are brought in. So we're not exclusively for academic institutions. Um, as learning is basically, um, I no. mean, it de depends on the definition, but uh, I would agree that uh, learning is very broad and uh, basically... Anything you do might lead to to actually learning something. So, tell us a little bit. Uh, so, interested uh, viewers, where can they learn more about you? Where can they find your work online? <laughs> okay, um, you certainly you go to Einstein.com. E I N Z T E I N.com. Uh, we are in private invite-only beta, so uh, if you sign up for the beta, you will get an invitation. Just be a, a little patient. We're sending them out in batches. And we will be opening this up to anyone and everyone in uh, the first quarter, about March of uh, next year. So 
leading up to that, um, please come check us out. And the best way to learn more about me is, well, you can Google me, and I think the first thing that comes up is something you wrote once. Uh, but but another thing you can, and it's uh, Gianmarco Masoni, G-I-A-N-M-A-R-C-O, M-A-S-O-N-I. But come to Einstein and check out my learning profile and um, click contact and send me a private message and say hello or just send a public message on the Welcome to Einstein project saying, this is who I am, this is what I'm interested in learning. That honestly is, is what it's all about because it's not about learning about me individually as a person as much as I'm happy to talk about myself. It's about sharing our, our knowledge and our learning through this platform. And the last thing I'd like to say is, uh, yes, there are many uh, different uh, things, uh, services out there that require that you sign up and take time to make a contribution. We understand that, and uh, we are building an API because ultimately we want this to be something that uh, is as open as possible and can be integrated into other products. Uh, if people see fit to do that, of course. We have to pass the test. <laughs> Great. So thank you, John Marco, for educating us and telling us a little bit more about what Einstein is. And, um, yeah, hopefully um, some people will feel encouraged and animated to join the crowd and become curators of uh, Einstein. That's right. We welcome right. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for talking with me today. Okay. Likewise, take care.